and welcome to our last lecture for Module 6. Today we'll be talking about autobiographical memory. Uh, in particular, autobiographical memory really is our memory of our life's experiences. Um, autobiographical memory has a number of important components that we're going to talk about. First of all, we'll talk about how autobiographical memory is really a hybrid between both semantic memory and episodic memory. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about what's called the reminiscence bump, and then finish up with the discussion of the narrative self. Uh, there's a lot more to autobiographical memory, but I wanted to hit some of the highlights um, and important sort of bits and pieces about uh, how our autobiographical memory is related to our sense of self, and that's where we get to the narrative self. So let's start with autobiogra autobiographical memory as a hybrid form of memory. So, autobiographical memory contains both facts about our lives, semantic memories, and contextual episodic memories. So, for example, uh, you have specific episodic memories about things like grade school, high school, uh, middle school, but you also have the facts about your life, about where you went to middle school and grade school and high school, where you lived at those times, who your parents are, who your brothers and sisters are, even who your friends are. Those are facts about your life. So for example, I grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I went to grade school at Helen Keller Elementary. I went to middle school at Russell Junior High School uh, until the end of the eighth grade, and then we moved to Canyon City, Colorado, etc. So those are facts that I know about my life. Now one of the things that we do often is when somebody asks, uh, asks us about an event, we retrieve the facts about that part of our life. So for example, um, I like to watch uh, Homicide Hunter with Joe Kenda because it takes place in Colorado Springs where I grew up. And so they'll talk about an event that took place and the first thing I do is think about, all right, it's 1986. That means I was a junior in high school, or it was 1974, and that meant you know, I was in grade school, or not even grade school at that point. Um, so you, you can use those kinds of facts to help guide you to specific episodic memories. So these two types of memories are often used in conjunction with one another to access memories. So facts are often used to guide us to specific time periods. And facts about our lives are also, again, tied to specific places. Where we were living at the time. Who were our neighbors? Where did we used to go? What kind of car did we have at that point? What kind of car would we have been driving? All of these things are part of what we know about our lives. So that's uh, one of the ways in which we're able to try to navigate information about our lives. Uh, is we use those facts to get us back to the specific contexts. Now there are a number of things about context that can um, spur memory. So we'll uh, visit relatives and we'll start talking about times and places and remember things we hadn't thought about in a long time as we get together and um, use each other to cue memories. Sometimes we get to specific places and uh, memories are cued. All of those are possible. So one of the things we know is this phenomenon called the reminiscence bump. Um, so over the lifespan, what events tend to be remembered particularly well? Well, significant events in a person's life often tend to be high, um, remembered very well. Weddings, um, sometimes things like a parent's death or you've been in an accident or a major illness. Um, so highly emotional events uh, fit right in with that, and also uh, transition points. So if you moved um, to a different part of the country, or you graduated college and started a new job, or again you started a new relationship, uh, all of these things uh, are transition points that mark significant events. So uh, in uh, some of these studies, participants over the age of 40 were asked to recall events in their lives. Memory tends to be very high for recent events and for events that occurred in adolescence and early adulthood, so between about 10 and 30 years of age. and um, We call this the reminiscence bump because it looks something like this. So people who are in their 50s um, are remembering life events and they tend to remember uh, events centered around age 20 uh, as the uh, time where they remember most things. Now, an important question about autobiographical memory is why, did this, why does this happen? Well, there are a couple of 
different potential explanations. Uh, first of these is the self-image hypothesis, where memory is enhanced for events that occur as a person's self-image or life identity is being formed. So in adolescence is when we start to get a sense of ourself, and then in uh, our 20s is when we start working and assuming identity as an adult and start to get an idea of who we are. And so that formative process um, of our development of self um, may be part of this um, process. There's also what's called the cultural life script hypothesis. Each person has a personal life story and an understanding of culturally expected events. And those personal events are often easier to recall when they fit the cultural life script. So go to college, get married, all of that occurs there in your early 20s. And that's one of the things that uh, we think occurs with the reminiscence bump is a lot of important events occur at that time. Your first marriage, uh, your first college degree, that sort of thing. Uh, in this particular um, cultural life um, event, we see someone who emigrated at age 20. Um, and you can see their memory is still best for events just prior to that. Um, whereas somebody who emigrated at age 34 or 35, you can see that that's where they tend to have most of their uh, memories because that's a significant transition point in their lives. Um, so all of these are potential explanations. Uh, finally is the brain fitness hypothesis. Uh, when you're in your 20s, in your late teens, early 20s is when your brain is at its peak. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that. It starts to decline after that. And so that's when you're most efficient at encoding memories. So these are uh, potential explanations for the reminiscence bump. I wanted to finish by talking about what we call the narrative self. And the idea here is what's called auto-noetic consciousness, which is our ability to mentally place ourselves in the past, in the future, or in counterfactual situations, and thus be able to examine our own thoughts. The idea is we can place ourselves, we can mentally time travel. And so we can remember ourselves in the past. We can also picture ourselves in the future. We can also imagine ourselves in particular situations that haven't occurred, but think about how we might respond, what might that be like, we can fantasize about those things. And that's what we call autoenoetic consciousness. Our sense of self also affects our behavior in the present, past, and future. It relates to how we reflect on our own past behavior, how we feel about it, and this in turn determines if we do it again. So our narrative sense of self, our life story, is one of the things that drives our behavior, but also is used to help us remember um, episodes. So the narrative self is a sense of self based on, on our life story. And we often recall events based on our sense of self. So we might leave out bits that are inconsistent with our sense of self. There's an important bit of work being done with the narrative self in um, areas dealing with things like um, difficult life events. And one of the things we see is how we narrate that journey. Um, are we able to sort of talk our way through it and bring ourselves to a reasonable conclusion and then uh, emerge triumphant from those difficulties is an important part about how we deal with those events. And in fact, that's the best way to deal with them is to uh, get the story of our narrative self uh, to the point where we can emerge um, having potentially learned something, but not necessarily um, damaged or distraught, but moving on and uh, keeping that as part of our life's lessons, but not our life traumas. And that's part about how we narrate our own self journey. And so it's important to understand how auto autobiographical memory can play an important role in things um, like uh, potentially difficult times. Well, that's our brief introduction to autobiographical memory.